welcome to this week's episode of Spooky Boy and the Spirit Sisters, a podcast for the strange and unusual by the the strange strange and unusual. All right, guys. So before we get into today's topic, let's do some house cleaning. Some things have changed as we now own our own domain and we are now on more platforms. So if you haven't already, give us some love, like, follow, subscribe to us on whichever app you choose. Buzzsprout, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Share us with your friends. Share your thoughts, experience, and stories with us. This is as much of an experience for us as it is with you. So let's explore and seek the truth together. Stay up to date with us with subscribing to our emails. Go to sbats.com. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook. In this week's episode, we're going to talk about demons and demonology. My name is Amanda. I'm Cassidy. I'm Lauren. And I'm the spooky boy, Austin. (laughs) So what is a demon, you may ask? A demon is an evil spirit or a devil, especially one thought to possess a person or act as a tormentor in hell. Demons are also performers and they are plot enhanced. Demons would be virtually unstoppable if it weren't for the few attributes that they lack. Um, They lack the capacity for reason, love, and compassion. And demons are completely driven by instinct. So they love lack and compassion. (laughs) Relatable. (laughs) Also, throughout all traditions, the demonic spirits have avoided the light of the sun love truth or reason i'm gonna have to contradict you on that because when i was looking into the origins of demons right so i wanted to see in christianity's views where did they start seeing demons as these things from hell right and angels as these beings from heaven and so In my research, it brought me all the way back to the Greeks, and they basically coined the word demon, but as they called them, they called them daemon or diamond, and they didn't view demons in that way. They viewed them as basically mediators or messengers of the gods, basically filling the space between like the atmosphere of where, you know, everything in between. So you had the humans, the daemon, and then you had the gods. And they were these ambiguous kind of creatures, spirits, and they could control the weather. They could control nature. Um, They could be a result of disease or they could be a result of, you know, what we would consider as a miracle or life kind of thing. They did not have this they were evil you know they actually had some you know rituals to summon them to do their bidding there was like a a ritual written down somewhere where it was back in greek times during like plato's i was going to ask about the difference between demons and daemons or if they are the same thing and if it's just like a yes so in Greeks mythology, they believed them to be one and the same. They weren't evil. Like how I was saying, I like contradict sort of your definition or term of it, because that's more been sort of what Christianity has put that in place, right? Hollywood, we have all the movies of these possessions and these, they're literally these fallen angels spawn of hell that are coming to take over us and drag us to hell kind of thing right and greeks they didn't believe that they truly just believed as i was stating before they're they fill the space and the atmosphere between us and the gods and they even some of them even believed that it would be like you and i died and we would then become a daemon so we would be able to be called upon as a past loved one or a lost soul to help guide the living for whatever their, basically whatever their needs were. There was like a love ritual to be like, hey, I need a demon to help so-and-so fall in love with me, right? So they actually had this belief that there was us, and then there was them, and then the gods. And they were either guides for us, or 
they could pass on knowledge, do anything that they sort of needed. They were above us in power level, but below power level in gods. So you had, they were really ambiguous because they were really viewed as this neutral thing. So if you had an evil heart and whatever you were wanting them to do for your bidding in that way, you could call upon them. They wouldn't give a shit. But like, All right, you, know, you summoned me. You called me. Okay. You want something evil? Here's something evil versus someone who's like, hey, I just want knowledge. Okay, here's knowledge. Oh, I want, I want, you know, this light spread across my community or whatever it is, right? So they could both like give evil and good. Yeah. Like they, they literally were neutral. Okay. Like they were just, like I said, they were either lost loved ones or lost souls of people who've passed on. They were spirits of nature. They were pretty much everything. Even sometimes they thought like in statues that they um, created for the gods that they would pray to. They also believed sometimes the daemon would reside in them so that when they were praying to those idols, that their messages would be broadcast through that statue that was possessed by a daemon then that would be broadcast to like Zeus or whoever. And he would then get the message, maybe give one back. And then they would get that in a dream or um, they would go to a medium and the medium would be like, Oh, this is what I'm hearing from the gods. Right. Okay. So, so they were like the middleman. Exactly. Between, yeah. That's exactly what they consider them to be. And then some of them, some Greeks also at the time believed that Damon were a little bit more than that, that there was a specific Damon assigned to every single person alive. So there's even some cultures today that still sort of believe in that, that idea, that concept of when we die before we get reborn, um, we pick a Damon and we hold them accountable to what our life lessons we need to learn or spiritual lessons. And we, they, are assigned to us and we basically are like you need to keep us guided on those paths so whatever we basically choose to do with our free choice you can help guide us in that direction but these are life life lessons i need to learn these are the spiritual lessons i need to learn via if it's good or it's bad and those daemon are considered to be connected to us basically like how some people view in christianity as you know guardian angels like a spirit guide exactly almost, right? a spirit guide so it wasn't until like i don't know a couple centuries probably in when the Sep septuagint which if i butchered that i'm sorry but that was considered the greek bible it got translated wrong um by judaic scholars so when they saw like disease and how greeks did associate sometimes that disease could be associated to the daemons if someone called upon them and was like hey make this person sick right well they still very much viewed them as a neutral being but in that translation that got slightly skewed it was oh they cause disease, they are evil, they cause possession. And as time went on, they sort of, they created like, you know, the Book of Enoch and the Dead Soul Scree Dead Soul, Dead Sea Scrolls, holy crap, can't talk. And part of what they tied into these daemons were fallen angels, right? So there's the story of the Watchers. Um, which was a huge group of angels who God assigned to observe us and only watch us to basically see where life takes us as humans. Well, these watchers saw these beautiful women, right? So these angels had the idea of, well, let's go down there. Let's procreate. So that's what they did. And then during that so-called giants or the Nephilim like were developed and what is Nephilim? Can you So Nephilim is basically the offspring of an angel and a human being. So 
you're more than a human, but you're not on the same level of, you know, a God. So think demigod, think Hercules, you know, okay. things like that. So him and him, Hercules, in his example in Greek mythology, he would be considered a daemon because he was in between. And even though they could physically see him and everything like that versus non-visible, he would still be considered that because he was above humans, but below gods. And in the book of Enoch and everything like that, as the Nephilim died, basically because they were these in-between creatures, they had nowhere to go. So the only thing they could do is possess other humans to take form of what they once used to be, therefore possession. And they were evil because God didn't deem that to be created. It was just humans, angels, you know, and God. And at that point already, you know, you already had hell in place with evil spirits, but there was nothing, no talk of like demons or anything like that. So that's pretty much the way in Judaic history, it sort of got translated that way. And then Christianity came in and they wanted to really hammer in good versus evil. So they took that idea and they were like, okay, here's these offspring, right? Here's these ones with disease or famine and everything like that. That's just demons. Demons are straight up doing that. But they wanted to give people this belief that Okay, there's demons, but also there's angels. So then they took like the stories of bravery and heroicness from like Greeks and other traditions at that time. And they translated those into, oh, well, that was a angel, you know, they're here for you. They're guiding you, you know, because they had to figure out, especially in pagan culture, how can we take the ideas that they have and transition them into our belief system, you know, mm -hmm. is like to say they really were smart and they really played the long game on like looking into history and looking into cultures and traditions. You know, you can look at saints and stuff that Catholicism has and Christianity has. And a lot of those saints are literally tied into other cultures, own heroes or, gods or goddesses and things like that um so they were like well let's make it simple let's make it clean so they don't have to worship multiple gods branching we'll off what one. austin said a lot of the modern christian and catholic saints that we see nowadays are actually taken dare i say stolen from pagan roots for example saint bridget is actually inspired or stolen from the celtic goddess Bridge or brie or brigid she has very many different pronunciations depending on what area you're from and actually the goddess we're gonna say the goddess Bridge because that's the irish pronunciation of it she was a very special goddess she was a part of a race called the Tuath de Danann. Now, before I dive into the Tuath de Danann, we're going to go into one of the histories of Ireland. Now, Ireland doesn't have an actual origin story. It is basically just one race of people were living in Ireland, and then another race of people came and drove the other race out, and so on and so forth. But where our story is going to start is with this demonic race called the Fomore. Now... The Fomore were a race of supernatural creatures. They were monstrous, hostile, very much like the demons we've heard from Christianity. Um, they are a demonic race that are from under the sea or the earth. Now, once upon a time, they had a chief, and his name was Balor. And... When he was a boy, his origin story starts with when he was a boy, um, he was looking into this potion that was being brewed by his father's druids. And as he looked into this potion that was being brewed, it was so powerful and so toxic that 
it actually caused him to grow this huge poisonous eye and the only way that it can be attended to is if he had other people attend to it for him because anyone that looked into the into his eye actually died instantaneously he had to have servants or attendants clean it for him open it up and then if one of the attendants died while doing that he just grabbed somebody else and was just like all right you're next of course he would be the chief of this demonic race as time went on a new race of gods emerged and there was this massive battle um called the battle of moitura where these godlike figures ended up defeating the Fomori and pushed them out of Ireland. And this race was called the Tuath de Danann, which literally transcribes to the people of Danu or the children of Danu. Now, Danu is this goddess. She's like the mother of all, basically. And the Tuath de Danann now were the next race of gods that inhabited Ireland. Now, the Tuath de Danann were very similar to what people know as, like, angels. They were very, I guess they were the more the lighthearted ones. You know, you had Lu, who was the sun god. You've got Breege, who was the goddess of craftsmanship and artistry and poetry and all this. So, very similar to angels, but also very similar to gods and goddesses of like greek and roman mythology and you also had a lot of that complexity where you had the twath they done and sleeping with the the fomore and all of that crap and they've got weird spawn that came from it but basically the twath they done in were seen as a race of skilled magicians and they were banished from heaven because of their knowledge so that's why they were put down to earth now, with that, they didn't reign for very, very long because they eventually were pushed out from Ireland by the Malaysians. Now, the Malaysians are said to be the true ancestors of the Irish, and they drove the Tuath de Danann into the hills. They became part of what is now modern-day fae or fairy folklore, but that is basically, it's the same concept, you know? You've got these demons here, or this demonic race, but then you've got these beautiful angel-like creatures or gods and goddesses that came and pushed them out. But with that, the Tuath de Danann did end up becoming part of fae and fairy folklore. And where this comes into play is I know last episode we brought up Banshees. And when the Malaysians came and they pushed the Tuath de Danan away, it said that they were pushed from the surface land into the burial mounds. Um, so they were no longer on the surface. They were pushed underground into these mounds. And the actual word for burial mound is she so the word banshee literally translates to woman from the burial mound so right off the bat it starts into okay this is where folklore starts to take place into demons and angels and all of this stuff um now a banshee from what we know today you know we've known them as these omens you see a banshee and they're usually screaming and you know okay something something bad's gonna happen or something's going someone's going to die there's there's something there now believe it or not the banshees from scottish lore were a little bit different they were known as the washerwomen as most of them were seen spotted at the edge of a stream washing out blood from clothing whether it's clothing of a friend that's about to die, a family member, or even if you notice that the clothing looks familiar, it could potentially be your clothing. Now, 
the banshee usually looks very like hag like you know she's not very beautiful she's very sinewy and you know she's not very pretty to look at um and they even say that her breasts are so long that she takes them and she throws them over her shoulder and they hang down her back. That sounds like a terrible, like, your mama joke. Like, her breasts are so long, she can throw them over her back. <laughs> and it's just, she's an all-around just horrid-looking woman. Um, but she doesn't mean any harm. She doesn't, it's just, she's a figure, you know? She's another figure of folklore. And we will go into Banshees, actually, in our Cryptids episode. One of these types of demons that they have is called a wolver. And it's basically a type of werewolf. It was never human. It just, it's a wolver. And it's not like the werewolves we're used to today. They aren't aggressive. Like, if you leave them alone, they're fine. You see them, they don't necessarily tear you apart and wreak havoc among the villages. Actually, they were just kind of domicile and they kept to themselves. There's been accounts of people finding fish left on their windowsills of poor homes. So they actually kind of take care of the people in the villages surrounding them. That's nice. So a little uh, different from what we see. You know, a lot of the the demons that we're used to kind of intermingles with the stories of the Fae in those parts. And which, us in America, we see them as, oh, cryptids or whatever, but actually they're more so, a, more a part of their daily life, their folk tales than what we see here in America. So this isn't like some Twilight shit? No, not at all. Like... All of their demons were never once upon a time, like, human. They've always just kind of been these supernatural creatures, and they even think that they might be spawned from the Femore. If you notice, all of these creatures have to do with nature. They are out in the forest, by the river. You know, if you've seen, if you've ever been to Scotland, which I have not had the honor or the privilege to be able to go there, everything is so beautiful and green and lush and you've got the mountains you've got the the trees you've got streams and these beautiful plains and the highlands like for example kelpies and these are shape-shifting water spirits they're seen as a horse and they typically lead humans to their death by luring them into water and then they devour them they drown them and devour them nice it's a killer seahorse? Basically, <laughs> That's yes. That's awesome. But it literally looks like a horse. Like, you look into the water and you'll see, like, the head of a horse. And it immediately, because you're like, what? A horse in the water? So it causes them to creep in. And then people go, oh my gosh, maybe you're stuck. Maybe you're not supposed to be there. So they, like, go into the water looking to, like, help this thing. And it lures them in. And then it, you know, takes its prey. So, hmm. If I have a damn horse in the freaking middle of a lake and it's like backing up as I'm trying to save it, I'm like, fine, go drown. I don't care. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Ouch. So a lot of their stuff is elemental. Their version of a vampire, no, they don't sparkle. But Darn it. <laughs> their version of a vampire actually has deer hooves for feet, wears a green dress, and their nails turn into talons. So, in more times, they're they're seen as women. So, me in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they sound fucking great. So, speaking of elemental demons, so we got water. And in Japanese, Indian, Egyptian, Babylonian, and Jewish tradition, it was the primal sea that which creation is emerged. The soup? The primordial soup. <laughs> and an example would be, and I am going to butcher this, um, so I'm very sorry. It is Tiamat of Mesopotamia. And she is the ancient Babylonian sea goddess who birthed all. 
She also holds the essential DNA of all demonic species, the dark, the creative, the turbulent, the protein spirit of the... the wait, un- oh, hold wait up, on you need to back second. up. Who is the protein demon? What is that? Is, it, no. is he swole? Wait, you actually said protein, yes. right? But it's spelled differently. It's P-R-O-T-E-A-N. Okay. I think you mean protean. Protean. <laughs> Fuck. Hey, no, it's all good. We got protean. We got the protein demon. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's just lifting over here. Like I said, I'm gonna. It's clean. I'm going to um, butcher things because I can't read. <laughs> He would look at that protein demon. He would look at me and be like, "No, nah, no." Nah. Hmm. Hi, my Get name's Amanda. Gym, I'm 25, boy. and I never learned how to fucking read. <laughs> okay, so the protean demon. Continue. Yeah. So the protean spirit of the unconscious deep, and then we have the mountain demons, and you know how in a mountain where you're at the highest peak, and often it. You can see like mists and clouds. Well, these spots are sacred sites of revelation to which only the holy may ascend. And an example of one of those spots would be on Mount Olympus or Mount Fuji. And all of these places have been points of contact with the other world. Um, an example of a mountain demon would be Mahisha Asura of India. Now, Mahisha, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is a basic form of a buffalo, but it's also a demon. So, <laughs> do you have something, Lauren? Does this buffalo dwell in the forest? <laughs> no. A mountain. Mountains can be... It's a mountain-dwelling buffalo, all right? Mountains can have forests, right? They can. So, therefore, I'm still not wrong. Austin and I, the other night, had a a very interesting conversation. (laughs) Um, So we were on TikTok, and Austin came along this video of this guy walking through, like, a forest trail, and... (laughs) They overlaid a sound or some sort of audio bit, and it sounds like a a growling or a groaning. And it was supposed to be like, oh, maybe it's Bigfoot. But me, I'm like, oh, what if it's a moose or possibly a buffalo? <laughs> to which Austin mm. bursts into laughter and goes... Hey, Lauren, how about you do me a favor? You go ahead and Google forest dwelling buffalo and you tell me how that goes. (laughs) I left the plains, moved to Portland, Oregon, and decided, hey, we're dwelling in the forest over here. Now, in Africa, there are, there is an African forest buffalo, but it's really not dwelling in like a forest well i just was a little confused so Amanda. <laughs> our next episode all about buffalo <laughs> where about they forest roam dwelling buffalo. forest <laughs> dwelling buffaloes so i could be correct in this episode <laughs> yes yes um, you could but also a quick google search showed us that protein Actually, oh, it's protean. Yeah, it's protean, um, and it means of or resembling Proteus and having a varied nature or ability to assume different forms. Um, and the second meaning is displaying great diversity or variety, a.k.a. being versatile. So I can't believe I said protean. <laughs> We're keeping this in the episode. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so backpedal a little bit here. Um, he's a shapeshifter who can be seen as a lion or an elephant or a human. And he actually has 
millions of multiples of himself. Which like personalities, like having a split personality, or like physical, physical, oh. multiples of himself, which creepy, weird, kind of scary. Um, His mother must have had a hell of a time keeping all of them kids lined up. <laughs> <laughs> but thing one thing two. Speaking of his mother. His mother was the buffalo part of him, and then his father was a demon. Moving on to forest demons. Buffaloes. <laughs> <laughs> so when you think of a forest, you think of it as just a step beyond the boundaries of civilization, and it holds a danger, mysterious type of feel with just like a bunch of animals in it. Well, one example of a forest demon would be Oni, which is from Japan. And this demon can fly, it can walk, and it has horns, and it has like a flat human face. Um, and it's three-eyed, three-toed on both feet, and then three-fingered. <laughs> If you guys could see <laughs> the looks of Lauren and Cassie right now. <laughs> Wait, okay. Flat face, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, in the, a picture that I saw of it, it literally, like, all of their features were flat. Like, like flat Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> like, their nose was flat. Like, they didn't have, like, any, like, real distinctive features. It was just like, you know a how- A two-dimensional human? Kind of. <laughs> kind of like that. You know okay. how like a bulldog has like a flat face? <laughs> kind of like that. Oh, all right. <laughs> but yeah, it's three-eyed, three-toed on each foot, and it has three fingers, or they call them talons too, um, on each hand. And they can range in sizes. Now- they present themselves when disaster strikes, and they are also associated with disease. Now moving on to desert demons. Now, before I go into the example, if you don't like feet, skip a little bit. All right, I'm out. <laughs> I don't yeah. like feet. I want to skip this part, but I'm not going to. It's essential that you know this. Yes. <laughs> when I read this, this, oh, I was gagging. All right. So these types of demons lived through the millennia without any regard for humankind. Now, the example, and like I said, if you don't like feet, skip a little bit, is the palace of the Arabian Desert. Now, there is no known description of this demon. However, this demon is a potentially deadly foot licker oh, species. no! I'm sorry. Hold on. I First told we got you. The protein demon. Now we got a foot licker. <laughs> yes, you I mean, heard me correctly. There's a reason why the word demon isn't supposed to put a good taste in your mouth, but yeah. Um, <laughs> like I. Yeah. Why feet? I don't yeah, know why feet. Why feet? They, I don't want to know. Let's just. They're Let's freaks. just skip past foot demon. No, okay. I'm I'm very curious so, as to why feet. Like fingers, elbows, genitalia. There really isn't any explanation as to why. Is it because everyone hates their feet? Prop maybe. Well, I mean when you think be. about it, like when you're grounding, like it kinda all starts with like the feet a little yeah. bit, right? Like That's a very smart thing you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Aww. you, Cassidy. It's like, what's the You're absolute welcome. worst thing someone can do to make me feel uncomfortable? Lick my feet. <laughs> yeah, that. That's I would rather mm -hmm. die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Foot licker species, and <laughs> 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 and if 
And if you think that's bad, it's not just one demon. <laughs> it's not just one demon. There's you a got whole brothers and sisters and cousins. <laughs> yeah, oh, shit. But they also attack their victims at night when they're sleeping. Mm. That's... I mean, of course they would. So, is this where the boogeyman like derives? Like, not putting your feet over the bed in case the boogeyman grabs them, but in like, where was this from? <laughs> Asia? The Arabian Desert. In the Arabian Desert, the reason they don't put their foot over the bed is because the demon might come and lick the bottom of their foot? Yeah. They lick the soles of people's feet until their blood is gone. So they're kind of like a vampire. What sucking vampires. It's great, right? Some people right? listening to this might be a little turned on right now, but we... <laughs> we are not promoting this. Uh, we're not condoning this. Now we move on to domicile. And these types of demons like to set up in uninhabited ruins or dwell outside the main house of, like, a farm or... Like an outhouse, even. <laughs> demon's watching you taking a shit. I picked the best ones. The shit demon. All right. <laughs> Nothing sacred. My feet taking a shit. Like. So essentially, they enjoy like the entrances of dwellings. Um, they like to lurk within the threshold to either harm or help the residents, so they can be a little Don't good. Are kidding. you saying <laughs> one might burrow its way up your ass to possess <laughs> you? No, I'm not, I'm not saying you. that. No, it's more like they lurk at the dwelling, like the entrance of the dwellings to like, Dwelling is a house, right? Not, yeah, not your body. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to dwell in that ass. Like, I'm <laughs> Don't put me down for foot licking demon or a demonic enema, please. <laughs> Pulling blast with fire. But when I when I say they help the residents, it's kind of like a protection type of thing. Like they are rule followers. Like if you set rules in your house for guests and they don't listen, they're gonna do something about it. They're gonna lick your feet and go up your ass. <laughs> One example, and it's actually in North America. <laughs> Great. There are many examples, but this is the one I chose. Um, it's called the Changing Bear Maiden of North America within the Navajo tribe. So, at first glance, this being looks like... A housekeeper of sorts and then all of a sudden you see her filled with rage and she shapeshifts into a lethal she-bear <laughs> as one does yes so yeah and then we move on to and that's only if people don't follow the rules or is it if they don't keep the house clean like how does do I contact the she bear or does she come to me? <laughs> like, how does that work? I think it's either. Um. But yeah, that she just she transforms like that's that's at least a useful demon. Yeah, like I would summon that shit all the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Me too. Like, let's let's get into more useful demons. <laughs> yeah, can I hire her? Well, it's like I, I highlighted way back in the origins. You could. Call upon them to do your bidding. Yeah. Call upon She Bear. <laughs> I think I'm just gonna cut my bit, and we'll just the whole episode is gonna be Amanda going through all of her demons. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So then we're gonna move on to the psyche demons, and these are the ones that inhabit the human being. Now, it could be like using them as like an instrument of their own will so essentially possession 
to their own will as in like the demons will or the humans will the demons will okay i didn't know if these were also useful demons like possess me and help me do my bidding or if it was <laughs> uh the other one <laughs> I'm yeah. still stuck. I'm still stuck on useful demons. Like I'm <laughs> writing this in my notes. Bear maiden. <laughs> <laughs> but an example of this one would be the Lyak of Bali. And this one appears at night as a eerie light or it can shape shift into a flying monkey or a bird. <laughs> So kind of like the monkeys from Wizard of Oz, essentially. Hmm. And these demons destroy crops, they kill people, and is considered the agent of all aberrant dire events. So yeah. And those are all the different types of elemental demons. How does one go about compiling and finding all these different kinds of demons out there? Like, there's water demons, there's mountain demons, forest demons, useful demons. <laughs> well, actually, that, that reminds me. Um, there are quite a few different demonologists out there. Um, I'm going to touch on a few of them. The first one uh, that I looked into was Montague Summers. AKA the worst fucking person ever. So this guy, he was born on April 10th, 1880 in Bristol, England, and he died August 10th, 1948. He was an English author who focused mainly on demonology, witchcraft, vampires, and lycanthropy. Uh, and for those wondering what the hell lycanthropy is, it's a fancy name for the supernatural transformation of people into werewolves. So he believed heavily in Satan and demons, and he thought that they were the focus. That Typical Aries. Yes. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Austin all offended over here. Um, he thought that, um, you know, Satan and demons were behind um, why witches were the way they were. Um, so after receiving his bachelor's and master's of arts degrees, he continued on and he became a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. And prior to becoming a priest, he was charged and later acquitted, along with another fellow clergyman, of inappropriate sexual activity with a boy. Shocked Pikachu face. Wow. <laughs> so this crap's been... Been going on for decades. I was gonna say, like, I'm lost for words here. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Trash human, trash human. But um, he he studied many demonologists, uh, such as Jean Bowden and Nicholas Remy, and he helped translate and edit various demonology works. So he, uh, pretty much all in all, he spent 30 years studying witchcraft. And he often thought that the subject was ignored by a lot of English historians. So uh, instead of using his research for good and helping people understand the true nature of witches, he uh, basically stated things such as this in his writings. Oh God, here we go. <clears throat> I have <laughs> endeavored to show the witch as she really was, an evil liver a social pest and parasite, the devotee of a loathly and obscene creed, an adept at poisoning blackmail and other creeping crimes, a member of a powerful secret organization inimical to church and state, a blasphemer in word and deed, swaying the villagers by terror and superstition, a charlatan and a quack sometimes, a bard, an abortionist, the dark counselor of lewd court ladies and adulterous gallants, a minister to vice, an incon inconceivable corruption, battening upon the filth and foulest passions of the age. I feel called out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this guy. Like, what a misogynistic prick. For real. Yeah, he's like, an asshole. Seriously, <laughs> fuck this guy, right? 
So he translated the Malleus Maleficarum, which was originally published in 1486, into English. And that was basically the driving force that was used to torture, punish, and persecute witches during the height of the witch executions and all that witch chaos that was happening. Um, but he believed that witches deserved punishment and was against any type of mediumship or seances, anything like that. Uh, one of his most famous publications is the History of Witchcraft and Demonology, which can be summed up nicely by this guy's review on Goodreads that I found. <laughs> yes. Uh, Riju Gangly. I'm sorry if I uh, mispronounced your name. He rated it one star. He said, Are you suffering from insomnia? Has excessive exercise of logic based on facts made you irritable and made everybody else look like simpletons? Is the most mind-boggling summer read failing to ensnare you in the trap of narrative offered by the unreliable narrator? In short, are you feeling bored but failing to simply doze off? Look no further, fam. <laughs> so, yeah, this this book is is pretty boring. Uh, a lot of people can agree on that. Uh, but basically this guy made a lot of terrible research and work available to the public that ended with a lot of innocent people getting killed. And what's even weirder is that him and Aleister Crowley even dined together in July of 1929. So literally a witch dining with a witch hunter. Like, what? <laughs> The uh, Crowley even wrote in his diary that dinner with Montagu Summers was the most amusing evening I have spent in decades. So I, I literally like to just imagine them sitting at Denny's at like 2 a.m. like mm. ordering the Grand Slam Slugger and just <laughs> trying to talk like, about how much they hate each other i would have loved to be a fly on the wall having right? the worst fucking person in the world sitting across from the evilest fucking person in the world like oh yeah i was really trying to picture how that scene would go down but um unlike crowley like summers kept his writings very literal and conservative and rooted in catholicism and he's also partly to blame for the reason why the vampire scare got so out of hand, mm -hmm. you know, as if, like, the world wasn't in complete chaos already at the time. But, uh, yeah, not a fan. Uh, zero out of ten stars would not swipe right on, tw on Tinder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he kind of leads into uh, Jean Bowden, who... Uh, came before Montague Summers. He was born in 1529 and died in 1596 from bubonic plague. He was basically the predecessor and inspiration for a lot of um, Mr. Montague Summers. He would cite a lot of pagan sources and didn't fully use his influence to defend the Catholic Church, which, like, props. But also, like, don't get it confused. He was still a very terrible person. <laughs> uh, he was a French demonologist and theorist, and he helped add a lot of fuel to the fire during the witch trials. Um, ironically, though, he did do a lot to establish the legal system and public law during the 17th century. Um, one of his most famous publications was The Six Books of the Commonwealth. Um, but that's a whole nother topic. He started out as a Carmelite monk and then taught as a professor of Roman law at the University of Taos. And basically, he believed that anyone that denied the existence of witches were witches themselves. So, like, damn, you, you really... That's you, some back ass weird thing. <laughs> you really yeah. can't win with these guys. Like, <laughs> Do you believe in witches? No. Well, you're a witch. What? Yeah, pretty much. It was pretty fucked up. So, like Summers, uh, he believed that witches were deserving of cruel punishment and that witchcraft was a terrible crime against any god of any religion. Um, so no one was exempt from that. Uh, he was best known for his work, The Denomania of Witches, and that was published in 1580. So this book, it was separated into four books, and it acted as a guide for people to 
help identify and persecute those that were suspected to be witches. And the books were divided into three main topics. So you had the legal versus illegal magic, his beliefs on witches and witchcraft, and then how to go about persecuting witches in court. So uh, during this too, he touches on there being good demons and evil demons and admits to having a daemon that would whisper instructions in his ear. So you can't have demons, but I can have demons and that's okay. Like my demon's a good demon, right? but every other demon is evil. Do you yeah. see what I, why? Like I was like, hold on, I got some stuff to contradict. Uh, yeah, the hypocrisy yeah, is, is insane. Fuck All, off. Like, my, oh. like I literally, I hope this daemon literally told him to jump off a bridge. Like, <laughs> for real. Well, remember, me off. remember how I highlighted that the daemons were neutral. They essentially, if you believe they were assigned to you before you were born or everything like that, they just guided, helped guide you to what you thought your purpose was because we have free choice. So, if he was like, oh, I want to know secrets from here and how the hell I can prosecute and persecute and all that for women, right? Well, Damon's going to be like, mm, like here and we go. And what pisses me off the most is when they did these stupid little hunts and they're like, demons and witches and bullshit. Like, more times than not, they weren't doing that. They were healers and people didn't like that they were using natural medicine and medicine that came from years and years of family lineage you know and oh but it's not what the church says it's not what our local medicine person says so you're doing witchcraft like mm -hmm. so many medis medicine women and midwives suffered from that when more times than not, they were actually doing more good than the actual doctors were of that time. Like, oh, this stuff pisses me off. Yeah, that's Same a good point. here. Oh, my God. I need to, oof, I need to, like, count to ten and lay on the ground. Like, <laughs> but listen, he wasn't all bad. He was, a, he was, Are you a, sure? <laughs> I, uh. He was against exorcism. Um, because exorcism or exercising, because <laughs> yeah. Lauren's okay with one of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, the only reason he was against exorcism was because he thought that there was this like j threat to the person that was performing it. But he was also like totally cool with just using a red hot iron to cauterize flesh. So like, wait, ow, wait, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cut the demon out. <laughs> Much, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. I, that, and even that's backwards thinking, too, because yeah. it's like demons are from hell, fiery pits of the abyss. So, we're gonna f use a red hot poker there instead no, of casting there was them no logic back? in any of this. No, yeah, I think remember, this is the guy that. who is like, Do you believe in demons? No, well, or what was it? No, do you believe in witches? Yeah. No, I don't. Well, you're a witch. Well, you're a witch. Yeah. Yeah, Pretty okay. Much. Yeah, I, I don't understand why burning gets a pass, but, like, exorcism is a no-no, but... Like, <laughs> fuck the patriarchy. <laughs> fuck all of this. Yes. He was also perfectly fine with having children testify against their own parents in court, too. So. Yeah. Um, Did mom give you an extra serving of mashed potatoes? No, she didn't. I think you should tell... The courts and everyone that she's a witch. <laughs> You're right! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what's kind of funny, too, is that, like, in 1571, he was given this royal privilege to work alongside the king's brother, the Duke of Alencon. I might be saying that incorrectly. Um, but he, later he was released from his royal favors after the publication of his little death handbook that he had. Um, and he was accused of being an atheist. So... Yeah, big whoopsie huh. there. Hmm. <laughs> Remember, that's interesting. no logic, doesn't make sense, count to ten, lay in the ground. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much, as I was researching this, I was getting so upset, and I was like, they're, they're just terrible people. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't do that research, because I would be throwing shit. Yeah, you you looked into much better demonologists, <laughs> I would say. Well, I, would, I wouldn't say better, but they're newer 
okay. than them and they're very controversial so it's but I love them anyways <laughs> Yeah, wait, who did you look into? So I looked into the infamous Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now, I have followed their work since I was like a teenager. Um, Ed and Lorraine Warren, they acted as consultants on some of America's like most famous paranormal cases and in these cases they would identify like what demon was in there and they would help with like the infestation and the oppression and the possession of both people and property now we all know that they have a museum, or they had a museum, because they have sadly passed on. And they I, still have it. They have, like, I think a friend who's I think taken it's over it. Their son-in-law is it that took okay. it over. Um, yeah, I'm but it is subscribed to their their like Ed and Lorraine channel or whatever. But it isn't open to the public. Yeah. yeah. So rats. The museum isn't open to the public? <laughs> Correct. Because oh. the, I believe the son-in-law doesn't want it to be. Um, What's he do with it then? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, they have the museum, and in the museum they have infested dolls, p like clothing that has been possessed. I honestly don't know why clothing would be possessed, but... <laughs> Um, well, kind of the topic that we uh, the topic we discussed last episode where um, certain things leave residual energy oh, yeah. on objects. So like with ghosts and spirits, um, they can if, if there's something that they truly treasured in their lifetime here, like there can be an imprint of some sort with this item, whether it's, you know, it more times than not you hear stories of it being like jewelry but it's not unheard of for clothing garments mm -hmm. stuff like that dude so. my underwear is gonna be so cursed watch out <laughs> <laughs> i uh, continue amanda <laughs> oh man all right they also investigated in america mostly but they also went abroad so they've pretty much gone all over the world. Um, now, Ed and Lorraine, they were very religious in their work. They always stressed that God does not let evil visit humans, but that humans must in some way invite malevolence into their lives. Now... By doing that, usually what they're using is by toying with the supernatural, like conjuring and a Ouija board and seances and like black witchcraft and satanic rituals. Which we stated in the last episode as well. If you are not well versed in these practices, don't do it. Do not touch them. They might be, especially during this time of year. Yes. Everyone wants to pick up a Ouija board. The veil is thinning. It's, please don't. Please be, like, don't, just don't do it. It's more difficult to get. Hey, have fun. <laughs> hey now. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey now, you're a rock star. It's more difficult to get rid of these things that you have summoned. Yes. Than it is to actually invite them in. Mm -hmm. So again, leave the divination tools alone. Yes, if you, if you don't, don't know what, you're, know what doing. you're doing. Yeah. But play responsibly. <laughs> but what if someone thinks they know what they're doing? See, there's that, then they're there's gonna, that thought process. Discerning. You know, like, you had someone who uh, thought he knew what he was talking about when he was like, are you a witch? No, I'm not. Well, you're a witch. Well, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Okay, so... Just because you pick up a book and you read one thing and you know of an item and you know, oh, because I read it, it's, it's like reading Oliver Twist. 
okay? Oh, God. I could read Oliver Twist. I can tell you about Oliver Twist, <laughs> but I personally cannot say I have experienced being a poor little boy on the streets of London. Like, I cannot say that I have experience with that. You know, just because you pick up a book or you read it on Wikipedia or something that you you just so happen to glance doesn't mean that you were fully knowledge in that topic. Like, if you really, really do want to be knowledgeable in that topic, do lots and lots of research, but also go beyond that. Seek out people who are well-versed in that sort of thing. You know, visit your local metaphysical shop. Reach out to a practicing pagan who knows what they're doing or, you know, a spiritualist. Yeah, do your research. Do it responsibly. It's just mm -hmm. as if you were writing a research paper. You have to have credible sources that are backed up. You know, you have to use fact. You have to fact check that. You know, there's... Yeah, don't go on WikiHow and look up no. how to get rid of all these negative attachments that you've gotten what? since I can't you go on fucking YouTube played with and the Ouija board. <laughs> you look can't at 3 just... a.m. challenges. Yeah, and... You can't just look at witch talk and expect to know everything from there or be scrolling through Pinterest and go, well, I saw a Pinterest post, so I can do this. Yeah, TikTok me to do this. <laughs> yeah, like, just, just don't... Please. We have to say this every episode. <laughs> Leave the Ouija boards alone. Yes. It's because it's getting closer to Halloween. People yes, and everybody's going to... I mean, there's one of the old, like, toy ones at Half Price Books right now. And I, like, looked at it and I was just like, I want to purchase this so that I can throw it the fuck away. <laughs> Like, I mean, I have two in my house, so. But that's different. You live with someone who knows what they're doing, right? So you don't have them, and you don't just play with them willy nilly. You know what comes with it. You know it's heavy stuff, you know. And when we do practice with the Ouija boards that we have, we set our boundaries. We know exactly what to do. We know how to protect ourselves if things start to get a little out of hand and that's because you have someone who's experienced with it mm -hmm. and yeah it's a it's okay to be a virgin with the ouija board i'm a virgin i've never touched a ouija board i've had interest in this stuff for years but yeah, i've it, never touched one either <laughs> it's it scares me a little bit and i want to make sure that when i do you know i'm with people that i trust in an environment that's safe aka lauren yeah. All right. So, um, getting back on track here. That ends our PSA. <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. We sorry about that tangent. <laughs> no, we're not sorry about it. No, it's a good tangent to always. Yes. Plug. Yes. One thousand times yes. Use discernment. <laughs> Practice safe hexing. Yes. Safe hex. <laughs> Like I said earlier, you kind of have to invite them into like into your life. And there are things that can happen if you do that. Now, there are three stages of a demonic possession. So the first stage is infestation, and then oppression, and possession. And then there's death. I want that on a t-shirt. So what is it? Infestation, oppression, possession, possession, death. death. <laughs> All right. Merch ideas. Our first merch idea. <laughs> Ed and Lorraine, like I said, they were very religious within their work. Now, their objective was to document and put into effect a closure through the clergy. They helped others that were afflicted through support blessings and prayer and little known fact they did not perform exorcisms themselves they had other people come in and do it though they attended and they helped but they weren't performing them themselves i didn't know that mm -hmm. i thought yeah i thought when it comes with exorcisms 
you have to be you have to have the okay from the Vatican to do that. Mm-hmm. Like, well, that's why they were consultants yeah. Yeah. of the Catholic Church. So like, they yeah. would go in and... They get all the yeah, documentation exactly. yes. and the evidence. And, yes. and then the church would then review that and then they would make that decision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they, since they were involved in all of that, they helped. Like they knew what to do, but they never performed them themselves. They strongly warned everyone that they should not perform them themselves, especially if they don't know what they're doing. So don't go look up an exorcism and try to do it yourself. Don't. All right, guys. PSA, <laughs> Another number little two. PSA. <laughs> um, just because it's in Supernatural doesn't no, no. mean you can do it in person. Look, no, no. Just, refer, just rewind this. Go back to PSA 1. Just yeah. listen to that. You're good to go. Yeah. Other than their demonology rescue work and their lectures and their guidance of the supernatural tours that they would do, they actually co-founded the New England Society for Psychic Research in the early 1950s. Now, on top of that, if you didn't think they already did enough, they wrote 10 books, which... I don't even think I could write one book in my whole life. So Ed and Lorraine, like I said, they have been a part of some of the most famous cases in the paranormal. Some of the bigger ones that they've done are Amityville. Everybody loves Amityville, especially me. Yeah, Ryan Reynolds was in that one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And they were... Also, were a part of one that involved a Ouija board. Now, this one took place in March of 1974, and it was one of the most sensational cases that they had involved a spirit board. Um, they were contacted by the Donovan family, and it was because their daughter had been using a Ouija board for months to talk to a spirit who had said that he died as a teen. So the daughter actually asked the spirit to manifest. Yeah. You heard me. She asked him. Oh, no, 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 no. (laughs) Reference our last episode on demonic entities and Mm -hmm. how they make their way in. Yep. After she told him to manifest, the family started to experience, like, bunch of unpleasant things destruction uh rocks would literally rain from the sky at their house yeah (laughs) i'm just i just find it so funny (laughs) they find a bunch of unpleasant rocks (laughs) (laughs) now i don't know the size of the rocks so it could be like hail okay but who knows just big rocks. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of objects would just levitate out of nowhere. And then they would see black masses manifesting. And it was a lot of noises that scared them. Now, when the Warrens came in, they investigated. And then they turned it over to the Catholic clergy for an exorcism. Because, again, they never actually performed the exorcisms. And... It was successful. Um, They performed a rite, and uh, in that uh, exorcism appeared a seven-foot-tall being with horns, cloven feet, and a tail. I would shit my pants. That's oddly specific. Yeah. 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 I would literally no, shit my pants. Like, <laughs> and they also were a part of another big one called the Smurl Haunting. Now, we'll go into that in a different episode because it is a big one. It's a crazy one, so stay tuned. With every good thing comes controversy. 
Ed and Lorraine were known for being different. With every case always came hate, I would say. Now, with Amityville, I guess they had no actual real evidence that it was haunted. Like, they had their accounts and everything, but there was no actual concrete evidence. Really? Yeah. Even yeah. though there was, like, didn't they bring in other investigators and people from the news, though? Mm-hmm. And nothing? I mean, because yeah. there's that picture that you always yeah. see online of that, like, little boy, like, peeking yeah. from, like, a room or yeah, something. Yeah, no, everybody, like, says that they can write it off. Like, that's... Huh. And, like... This is all, like, opinions of other people. Yeah. Like, I believe that this stuff happened, but not everybody is going to. Mm -hmm. So, and like Amityville, there's, there's Annabelle. Annabelle is the most famous doll in the world. There's a story that Ed Warren was telling people before he passed away that... One time, this guy came in and was taunting Annabelle. And when he left, he got in a serious motorcycle accident. Now, this is a huge story that he told a lot of people. But he never gave names or actual, like, proof that this happened. It was just word of mouth. Mm -hmm. So, people think... That it didn't happen and that he's just making it up. So they didn't even have the name of the motorcyclist? No. That no, was... because it was, they didn't, I don't think they had, like, see, this is, this is the one that I think maybe might not be real. Like, I know Annabelle can do shit. Like, <laughs> yeah, she's scary. You won't catch me near her. I'll go near it. Oh, of God, course Austin. you will. You would antagonize just so you get some sort of... I'm scared to go ghost hunting with you. I'm not. Yeah, that's valid. <laughs> <laughs> I was like thinking about that. I was like, no, I'm you like, shouldn't be. But then I was like, yeah, I don't know. I'm like the in-between Austin and Cassidy. Like, I'll think it's a good idea, but... Uh, that's... It, I, I feel like <laughs> I'm the same way. Like, I'd be afraid... But at the same time, I I don't know. I can be a real skeptic at times, but yep, I just I don't know how I will be unless I'm actually in that scenario. Mm -hmm. Like I'll probably have to take a couple of shots before we actually <laughs> go out anywhere hey, just to calm five. my nerves. But <laughs> like I I mean, I'm not going to I don't believe in antagonizing for the sake of antagonizing. Now, if there's history behind like a ghost being a shithead. I'm going to call it out. I'm going to be like, hey, well, yeah. listen here, shithead. <laughs> get good. <laughs> oh, or God. get gone. Uh, we're doomed. <laughs> we're in trouble. <laughs> Getting back on track. My favorite scary movies are the Conjuring movies. I have to say those were... Yeah, those are good. They were very well made. Yes. And I think those were the first movies that I legitimately was scared watching mm -hmm. and it left me like it, it's that movie you you finished watching the movie and you were like okay i'm yeah. going to sleep never right <laughs> yeah those those were good movies way better than paranormal activity or whatever bullshit oh god <laughs> <laughs> don't get me started on those but that movie was about the parent family the controversy around that is the current owner of the home that the parent family lived in did her own investigating she said that the witch from the film bathsheba sherman was anything but a witch and that the satanic worship and the infant sacrifices or like general witchery that they show in the film is all fabricated like it never happened Never happened as in, like, there's no proof that it did happen or it just flat out never happened. 
flat out never happened. She said that the Perrin family made it all up. Like, she doesn't have anything in the house anymore. Or, like, she never, like, there's nothing going on in the house, which I find very hard to believe. Very hard. Yeah. Considering what the Perrin family went through in that house. She also said that the Warrens made everything up, too. Like, that they told the Perrin family what, like, what was going on, essentially. So they that kind it of, was, like, coaxed their story. Yeah. Like, well, this is what we feel happened, and this is what we're picking up, because Lorraine was a psychic. Mm -hmm. So... Yes. I can see where they could be like, yeah, this is what we're, we're getting. This is what we feel. This mm -hmm. horrible thing happened. And then a family who doesn't know any better just goes, oh, yeah, this happened. And this is what they said. And especially at that point, too, was this one of their more recent ones? Like, did Amityville and all that other ones happen after or like before this one? Yes. Or, okay. So when you think about it and you just like take a skeptic kind of a skeptic kind of like step out of the situation mm -hmm. all of these other high profile cases happened and now they have this situation here it's like well it just it makes sense like yeah like it makes sense from a skeptic's like point of view and they had all that fame from before i can mm -hmm. almost see someone if I was that kind of person going and being like, yeah, you know, we're renowned. Here's all credentials mm -hmm. and going into a house and being like, oh, I feel I feel there was oh, there, very bad witchcraft happened here. And that's that's mm -hmm. what I'm feeling. And, yeah. you know, there was infant sacrifice here or, you know, that's just what I'm picking up psychically. There's a lot of controversy that surrounds them. They. They did good, too, so it's, yeah, it's coming from someone who really, really liked Ed and Lorraine Moore, and it's kind of, the controversial side is kind of hard for me. <laughs> like, I can see both ways, and two, defending them. Like, as someone who's had weird experiences happen right. through growing up and through my awakening, yeah. like, telling other people who've never had stuff like that happen before this is what i've seen this is what i've dreamed and mm -hmm. it's come to fruition you're not gonna understand unless you've been through it right so having them come out and be like we've seen all this really weird spooky shit and people are like well that never happened that's weird i've never seen anything like that happen they're quick to automatically write it off as a fallacy yeah so yeah that's I what can... i was gonna say like you can you can view it in both ways mm -hmm. for outside people who are just, I think it's all bullshit, you know, mm -hmm. like you can clearly see it that way and be like, it's yeah. bullshit versus other people who, who a have experienced weird things or the people it's, who did live there and mm -hmm. they're stating like, no weird shit did happen. You know, unfortunately it's easy to see it from both sides. Exactly. But yeah. again, until you've actually experienced something like, I've never, I don't think anyone at this table right now can say that they've experienced anything demonic. Yeah, I've never seen but, a seven foot horned creature with hooves and a tail yeah. chilling out and in I my living room. And I hope we never get to that point. But some of us have had experience with ghosts and even just ghosts themselves and spirits, like the stuff that they've been able to do. Mm -hmm. Like, imagine something <laughs> that has a little more juice behind it yeah. i guess is it that protein demon yeah <laughs> the juicy protein demon i'm never gonna He's let juicing. that one down <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we had the parent family and then now we have the okay the sneakador 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 how's it spelled s-n-e-d-e-k-e-r <laughs> We're sorry if we butchered your last Sne name. Sned Let me see occur. I like the sneakader. Yeah, I like that one too. Like, Snedecker? Snedecker. That sounds right. Snedecker. Yeah. Sorry if I butchered that. 
I'm not really good with weird words. Snack. But this case was actually made into a book that they wrote. It was, or, yes, a book, and then it turned into the movie A Haunting in Connecticut. Oh. Yes. Oh, with ectoplasm? Mm. That okay. one. Ectoplasm? Can't talk? All right. <laughs> that was actually, that was the first, I think that was the first one that came out, actually. And mm-hmm. then, like, The Conjuring and stuff. Yeah. That movie made me shit my pants. Really? Not literally, <laughs> but, like. <laughs> Scared the shit out of you? Yes. I yeah. was at a neighbor's house, and it was a graduation party, and we watched it. Mm-hmm. Now, we weren't even in, like, you know when you watch a horror movie, you're supposed to have the lights out. Yeah. and everything cranked up in a right. bad ass like audio system yeah no we were just all gathered around a tv in broad daylight and like watching this movie but i shit you not by the time this movie was over i would not walk next door back to my house by myself i was just like fuck no i don't blame you like i'm not walking across this fucking field while there's demons out there right? like Right, that movie. That movie was so made so amazingly, and it re reignited my my love for horror. Yeah, it was a good movie, but um, I mean, I thought it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cassidy keep just that, died. Just keep that moment in there, though. <laughs> Cassidy just died. Was that the movie with the clapping? Where they played the clapping? No, game? that was The Conjuring. That was The Conjuring? Okay. Yeah. This was the one where the kid was in the basement. He had cancer. And they found, yeah, yeah. And they found out that he, the house was actually a like funeral a funeral home. Yeah. A, yeah. Yeah. That yeah. and the bodies were in the walls. Like, yeah. yeah. That was a good one. Yeah. Oh. Right, anyways, let's- so, <laughs> um, there's this guy, his name is uh, Ray Garten, and he interviewed the whole family about their experiences, and he noticed that something was off during their interviews. Um, he said that the family accounts didn't mesh together, like, as they couldn't keep their stories straight. Um, he then went to Ed Warren and... Apparently, Ed had said to him that they were just crazy. You got some of their story. Just use that and make the rest up and make it scary. That's saying a lot. When a renowned renowned demonologist goes to you and goes, you're crazy. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Joe Nickel was actually one of their neighbors and... Or, yeah, he was their neighbor. And he said that most of the paranormal happenings are due to the fact that the family had a serious drug and alcohol addiction. Mm-hmm. So he's saying basically that that is what made it, like, made them think that these things were happening. But a lot of people also said that another, it was another one of those cases that Ed and Lorraine Warren fed everything to them. There's a lot of controversy surrounding them, but they did they did a lot of good things and they may have done some bad things, but they did more good than bad. I also looked into Ed and Lorraine like throughout the years. Um and my thing was the thing that kind of bugged me was everything to them was okay, you have to have a strong faith, but everything you do in life is going to bring like, going to entice a demon into your life. Like, mm-hmm. there was nothing that you can do that was just, oh, you're doing this? Cool. It was always, it's because a demon wants your ass. Mm-hmm. Like, I won the lotto. Like, I want a scratch off. Well, that's a demon trying to lure you in. Yeah. I went and had a celebratory drink with friends. Well, that's how you get demons. Like, I can't, there would be nothing that a person can do that would just be like, okay, everything had some sort of demonic attachment to it yeah and i think that was just the demonologist in them like they're surrounded by all this shit like and nine times 
eight times out of ten, I should say. Seven and a half. <laughs> Seven and three quarters. <laughs> Let's get specific here. Um, it was a demon that was making these things happen. Like, in all these cases, not every time it was. And they discovered that, and they, but they still helped them, like, get rid of it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So... Yeah, controversy. Everyone's gonna have that, mm-hmm. like in this world, like yeah, absolutely. Especially it's, with something like a topic like that. Yeah, like, like demons are demonologist. Yeah, demons are a huge topic. Like, and two, you've got all of Hollywood feeding into that as well. Mm-hmm. You know, like we said before at the beginning of our show. Um, Hollywood fed a great deal into how we imagine and picture demons nowadays. Mm-hmm. They you glamorized know? it. They do. You know, we've got Poltergeist and we've got The Exorcist. My and, favorite movie. Yeah. <laughs> absolute favorite movie. But even in TV shows, you know, you've got mm-hmm. shows like Supernatural, Buffy mm-hmm. the Vampire Slayer. Yep. All the demons all came from hell or from an evil source. You know, there was no like, like okay, that's wrong because in Angel there was a nice demon, but like for the most part, the the demons we've seen were always bad. Like just like we've always been told, white light is good, dark black shadows are bad like there was never a gray area you know so when once upon a time it wasn't like that with demons well with that that was a very very heavy and dark topic we discussed for this episode i think that i think we can close the book on this we just barely scratched the surface with demons but we do intend to revisit the topic of demons and demonologists in another episode because there's so much out there. Um, and imagine, it was so hard for us to sum up what we actually wanted to cover for this episode. But just because there's so much out there. I had like a total, I think, of like eight or nine pages of stuff that I was like researching. And mm-hmm. I don't know how I cut that down, but I did. <laughs> and there's a couple of books in my wish lists about demons and demonology that I'm going to read for the future and we'll do like a like a book club or a book review kind of thing on it um book club so but (laughs) watch out oprah (laughs) this is the demonic book club (laughs) Um, it's your boy but i think we we did a fairly decent job of trying to go over this topic again if you've made it this far we thank you so much for taking this trip with us Please let us know your thoughts, your comments, your stories. I mean, we haven't had any run-ins with any demons, but if you have or you know someone who has or you've heard a story, please let us know. Literally had sex with one, but okay. (laughs) (laughs) I'm out. Cassidy's sex story with a demon. We're going to save for another episode. Yep, that's for OnlyFans. <laughs> <laughs> but please, if you have any comments, any stories, any experiences, either you or a friend or a family member has experienced, please send it our way. We would love to hear it because, as we said before, this is as much of an experience as much of an experience for us as it is with you we want you to take this journey with us so please send us some love follow our socials visit our website everything will be linked inside of the episode notes as well as our resources for our our research because we want you to see exactly where we got our sources and if you find something that contradicts anything that we've said Let us know. We are completely open. Anybody else have any final thoughts or comments? I guess my whole thing is, is do your research, keep an open mind. Because as, you know, going back to the Greek mythology, their view on them versus 
jump to modern day and how we as society see demons now, you know, like it's interesting. Yeah. And like I said, we'll put all of our research notes and comments and stuff in our episode notes. So you can look at the same sources we did and maybe you pull something different from the source than we did. Yeah. You know, it's maybe it's, there's something we missed. Yeah. It's all there for your viewing and listening pleasure. Mm -hmm. So with that, thank you for listening. Join us next week where we'll be discussing cryptids, mythology, and folklore. Oh, and yeah. Until then, stay spooky, folks. Bye, guys. See ya. Later.